Hello from me, Jenny Devitt. And hello from me, Terry Bennett. And a warm welcome to you to the BV Magazine podcast, your slice of genuine Dorset rural life. And this is the third and final August 2022 episode. And in this third episode, we'll be hearing about what life was like in the Iron Age in Dorset from significant archaeological sites near Winterbourne Kingston. Jane Adams tells us how you probably can't hear bats, but your children may be able to. While Hazel Ormrod of the Dorset Wildlife Trust gives us the exciting news of the first beaver kits to be born in the county for over 400 years. Carl Minton forages for elder, primrose and the ubiquitous blackberry. Charlotte Toombs explores the world and benefit of growing biennials. We hear how ragwort can create controversy in the countryside. James Cousins talks of the challenges for farmers of our recent heat waves. And Mel Mitchell provides some tips for keeping moving, whatever age you may be. And finally, in this third episode, Karen Geary gives us some great tips on what we need to be eating to keep our skin looking good. History, Dorset Life in the Iron Age by Roger Guttridge. Fresh insights into life in Dorset more than 2,000 years ago are emerging following the latest Bournemouth University archaeological dig on the Chalk Downs near Winterbourne Kingston. Since 2009, students and volunteers have carried out 11 excavations on eight sites at Northwest Farm. The earliest thing we've found is Bronze Age from 1400 BC, and the most recent has been post Roman at about AD 500, so almost 2,000 years of archaeology, says Dr. Miles Russell, Bournemouth University senior lecturer and archaeological fieldwork director. The digs have captured the public imagination, and more than a 1,000 people turned out for the latest open day on the 3rd of July. The main feature this year was 65 Iron Age pits dug into the chalkland, with depths ranging from a metre to two and a half metres, and dated to 100 BC and earlier. They're sited within a banjo enclosure of banks and ditches, so-called because it's shaped like the musical instrument, with a long neck or entrance, as well as a circular enclosure. The banjo dates from 300 to 100 BC and was probably used to contain cattle. Two roundhouses were also found, but the floors have been destroyed by ploughing. It's thought the pits were originally used as sealed underground larders for storing grain, meat and dairy produce, but they also appear to have found a second purpose. Many contain animal bodies that have been dropped in before the pits were backfilled, said Dr Russell. We think they put animal body parts at the bottom as offerings to the gods. We found sheep, cattle and horse body parts, but with the flesh still on them and the bones still articulated. We've also found the complete remains of a few dogs, which may have been hunting dogs or perhaps guard dogs. Britain was known for its hunting dogs. The animal parts date from around 100 BC, around the time when the pits were abandoned and 150 years before the Romans arrived. Dr. Russell says the latest discoveries are leading to a better understanding of rituals of that period. The majority of the animals we found were not butchered for meat, he says. The 2022 dig also uncovered five human burials from 100 BC to AD 50, bringing the total from all sites excavated to about 60. The five were all buried near the top of the disused storage pits. This was after the site was abandoned, suggesting that the bodies were brought there by people living nearby. Dorset was almost the only place in the country where they buried their dead in the Iron Age, so we're able to get information about health, nutrition, injuries and age at death that we don't get anywhere else, says Dr Russell. The human remains have been taken to the university to be studied before being reburied close to where they were found. The archaeologists are still uncertain about how people on this well-drained chalk downland obtained their water. The bones of hundreds of frogs found at the bottom of some of the pits imply that there must have been ponds or some other regular water source nearby. Yet no clay-lined ponds have been found, suggesting that the locals may have had to fetch their water from the Winterbourne stream more than a mile away. It's something we've been unable to resolve, he says, it's assumed that the frogs were attracted into the pits by dampness or water at the bottom, and having got in, they couldn't climb out. 
Together, the Northwest Farm Digs are contributing to a potential rewriting of the presumed history of the area at and before the Roman invasion in AD 44. The traditional assumption is that the local Durotrigas tribe lived in hill forts such as Maiden Castle, Hod Hill, Hambledon Hill and Badbury Rings, and fought to defend them against the invading Romans. But the evidence suggests that the hill forts were mostly abandoned a hundred years before the Romans arrived, says Dr. Russell. What has been interpreted as evidence of battles might simply have been target practice. There was something happening at the big settlements with hill forts, and some of the big banjo enclosures are coming to an end at the same date, and nobody knows why. The archaeologists expect to return next year to an area with so much archaeology that Dr. Russell says it would take centuries to dig it all. Finds on adjoining sites in previous years have included Iron Age roundhouses from 100 BC and a Roman villa close to the graves of five people who may have been its owners. Of the 700 villas excavated in Britain, so far no others have produced a burial ground, said Dr. Russell in 2014. Wildlife and Outdoors Can You Hear the Bats? by Jane Adams I was 11 when I first heard a bat. A friend had invited our family to a barbecue, and as the sun set and the adults got tipsy, bats appeared. Except I didn't see them, I heard them. Their high-pitched squeaks and squeals were so loud they seemed to pierce holes in the cooling September air as bats weaved around my head, catching mosquitoes. I asked my dad what the bats were saying, and I remember him laughing and telling me, you can't hear bats, and that's what I believed for the next 30 years. We have 18 species of bat in the UK, and most are in dramatic decline thanks to modern farming practices killing their food and humans excluding them from roosting in our houses. The one you're most likely to come across is the pipistrelle. These tiny bats only weigh between 4 to 7 grams, have a jerky, erratic way of flying, and can eat up to 3,000 flies a night. Although they can see quite well, they navigate and feed in the dark by shouting at very high frequencies and waiting for their shout to echo back, known as echolocation. The next time I heard a bat, I was on a bat walk organised by Dorset Wildlife Trust. We each had a bat detector, a black box which looked like a small transistor radio. When tuned to the right frequency, the detector allowed us to hear the echolocation calls of the bats as pops, whistles and slurps. It was magical. Although my dad was right about most things, he'd been wrong about bats. Children and some young adults can hear the lower parts of their ultrasound calls. However, as we age, the cells in our inner ear become less sensitive and we lose that range and the ability to hear the bats shouting. So this month, on a warm evening after the sun has set, take your children or grandkids for a walk in the countryside and get them to listen for bats. Although you probably won't hear them, it may be your child's only chance to experience this unforgettable sound with their own ears. To help bats thrive in future, go to Bat Conservation Trust at bats.org.uk. The first two beaver kits born in Dorset for more than 400 years by Hazel Ormrod from the Dorset Wildlife Trust. Dorset Wildlife Trust has been closely monitoring the pair of beavers released into an enclosed site in West Dorset last spring. It's been clear that they formed a strong bond and the sighting of a kit during July caused much excitement, being the first beaver kit born in Dorset for more than 400 years. Discreet observations finally bore fruit almost two weeks later when trail cameras captured images of two young beaver kits and their mother. Seeing the first kit was an incredibly exciting moment for the team behind the project. Breeding is a clear indication that the adult pair are healthy and happily settled in their Dorset surroundings. Staff and volunteers have been closely monitoring the pair of Eurasian beavers as they've worked to build dams creating the watery woodland and deep pools in which they feel secure. While the trail cams have only identified two kits so far, it is still possible that there are more, as beavers can have up to four kits in a litter. The team is watching patiently, 
The beavers are rather elusive and it's difficult to get them on camera at the same time. Eurasian beavers were once native to Dorset and common across the UK, but were hunted to extinction for their fur, their glands and their meat in the 16th century. They're social animals who live in small family groups, typically consisting of an adult pair and two generations of young. Mating occurs once a year in the winter months between December and February, and if successful, after a gestation period of around 105 days, the young are born during spring. Beaver kits are born fully furred and with the ability to swim, and normally stay close to their parents as they're very vulnerable to predators. For the first two to three weeks, kits feed on their mother's breast milk, but within six weeks, they'll begin to venture outside the lodge, exploring their parents' territory while foraging and feeding on tree leaves, shoots and aquatic plants. Beavers have the potential to make a huge difference to a natural environment by increasing biodiversity as well as providing other, wider benefits for humans, such as storing carbon in the wetlands they create and reducing flooding downstream by slowing the water flow. The Dorset Beaver Project is a five-year scientific study in partnership with the University of Exeter and Wessex Water, to assess the potential impacts of reintroducing beavers in the environment and to raise awareness and understanding of what it means to have these influential mammals back in our county. And some beaver facts. Beavers are large, semi-aquatic rodents, the second largest rodents in the world after the capybara of South America. Contrary to popular belief, Beavers are herbivores. They don't eat fish. They prefer to snack on herbaceous vegetation and aquatic plants in the spring and summer before turning their attention to trees and their bark, their leaves and shoots in the autumn and winter months. Beavers live for an average of 12 years. There are two species of beaver. The Eurasian beaver, which is castor fiber, the species we have in the UK, and the North American beaver, which is castor canadensis. Primrose and Berries, but not as you thought you knew them, by expert forager Carl Minton. Those of us with younger children will be only too aware of the need to fill voids created by the school summer holidays. And what better way to occupy them than with excursions out into the vast array of public footpaths and woodlands that surround us in the Blackmore Vale? And if it's your own time that needs filling with something healthy and rewarding, well, the sentiment stands. We spend so much of the year here in the UK dreaming of what we'll do in the heady days of summer, let's not let it slip past us without really making the most of the opportunity a little sunshine and the open space afford. I want to start this month by revisiting a plant I discussed last month, the elder, or Sambucus nigra. If you took my advice in July, you've already harvested the flowers and are no doubt sipping on some delightful homemade elderflower cordial while reading this edition. Well, now we return to this bountiful plant for our second elder shopping trip of the season, to harvest the berries. As stated last month, elder is one of the most abundant hedgerow harvests we have, with many landowners opting to use it to form the hedges that border our country roads. As a result, elderberries are extremely abundant and very easy to find. They can be used for jams, jellies and crumbles, but these juicy sweet berries can also make liquor and syrups. BV nutritionalist Karen Geary shared her recipe for elderflower rob last year. She calls it a nutrient bomb and suggests taking a daily spoonful during cold and flu season. You can search for it on the website www.bvmagazine.co.uk. Used for millennia, the elderberry's distinct flavour can also make a simple puree to serve with meats. Be aware that all parts of the elder are mildly toxic when raw, so be sure to cook them. Elder trees have feathered leaves that grow in opposite pairs along the stem with a terminal leaf. The berries are deep purple and formed from the same sprays of flowers we targeted earlier in the year. Next, I wish to continue my crusade against boring-looking salads and bring you the common primrose, Primula vulgaris. A plant most walkers will already be familiar with, Primroses don't tend to grow in shade, so be on the lookout for sunlit areas of meadows and forest clearings. The whole plant is edible. The roots, stems, leaves and petals have all been consumed for culinary and medicinal purposes by our ancestors as they contain a wealth of vitamins and minerals. 
Their petals are yet another way to brighten a salad, although these are more likely to have been found in spring. But in August, the roots can add a crunch and the leaves can also be included. Be aware that if you plan on harvesting roots, you will need the landowner's permission. To harvest the rest of the plant, our rights are protected in statute, which allows us to forage the four Fs, flowers, fruit, foliage and fungi, on public land. Finally this month, I want to talk to you about a plant many people think they know, but I assure you most do not. When I am out leading foraging walks, I know from the look on people's faces that no one wants to learn about blackberries. Everyone has been picking them since childhood, collecting them from the hedgerows with their parents. But stick with me, there is a secret layer to be uncovered here that will change your understanding of this quintessential foraged harvest. When out picking blackberries, we have all eaten a tasty fruit straight from the bush and remarked to our fellow pickers, try these, they're delicious, only to follow up a few minutes later by taking another from a different spot just a few metres away and finding it so tart it makes our eyes water or so bland as to be inconsequential. So what is going on here? I have heard many versions over several years of how the taste is being affected by the weather or the soil conditions or some other capricious act of nature affecting this plant this year. In fact, this seems to be the prevailing thought amongst most novice foragers. However, there is a far more interesting and predictable component to this mystery. Vegetable gardeners are familiar with the idea of picking a specific variety of plant to grow in their garden. We choose to grow a certain tomato variety for its giant fruit, small fruit, yellow fruit, blight resistance or huge yields, and yes, of course, they all taste different. You may be surprised to learn, though, that we also have hundreds of varieties of blackberries growing wild in the UK. It naturally follows that your hedgerow harvest contains a huge variation in flavour. So what can we learn from this? I would suggest that instead of a haphazard wander along a hedgerow, try making a blackberry map and marking the location of the tastiest fruits. Harvest from those plants every year and you can reliably collect the perfect fruits for eating fresh with desserts while avoiding the sour face lottery. Sowing the seed of next summer by flower farmer Charlotte Toombs. Biennials were always a bit of a mystery to me before I started to sell my flowers, but they really aren't that mysterious. And once I got my head around the fact that you sow the seed in one year and they flower the next, it's easy. If you were to plant an annual now, it would flower in late summer and would be a very disappointing plant rushing to complete its life cycle before the days get shorter and the threat of frost looms. The definition of a biennial is a flowering plant that takes two years to complete its life cycle. Since growing flowers for sale, I've learned that if you sow your biennial seeds now, they're big enough to plant out in the autumn when they'll have the chance to develop and grow a healthy root system to survive the winter, all being well. Then when it warms up again in the spring and the daylight hours increase, they're ahead of the game, ready to start the growing season. They tend to flower when the spring bulbs have finished and before your autumn sown annuals, filling that lull after the bulbs are over. The biennial family of flowers seems to be quite a nostalgic group of plants. Think wallflowers, for example. And no, don't think of those horrid orange, yellow and brown tones like a 1970s swirly carpet. There are some beautifully coloured varieties that really are worth growing. Look for the Sunset series, in particular the apricot, although it does seem rather hard to find the seed, which I see as a good indication that it is tip-top. The Sugar Rush series is another good variety. It has the added bonus of smelling glorious when you rush past one on a warm spring day. Another biennial to look out for and so is Hesperus, Sweet Rocket, white or mauve and also scented, but a member of the cabbage family, so watch out for hungry pigeons. I speak from experience. I had to put a net over the bed one year. It took me forever to work out what was eating them. Honesty is another pretty white flower, but resist the urge to pick it and instead wait for its prized seed heads. Peel the papery case off to reveal a lovely silvery disc, like a coin. No wonder this plant is often called the money plant. It's very popular for Christmas wreaths and dried flower arrangements as well. Foxgloves are also a nostalgic and popular biennial.
The last biennials that I grow myself are in the Dianthus family, Sweet Williams. They're a cottage garden favourite for good reason. Easy to grow, they smell amazing, and they make great cut flowers too. Look out for a variety called Sooty, which makes a nice contrast with the ones that have an eye. As a bonus, they're all great for pollinating insects too. Another seed to sow and try is wild carrot. You can get a beautiful purple variety. The more common white variety has, in the centre of each flower, a dot of blood red, which legend says is a stain from when Queen Anne pricked her finger while making lace. So why not try planting some biennial seeds this month and being a patient gardener? I promise you won't regret it. Farming. Poison or Pollinator by Andrew Livingston. They're like effing trees, Martin, our farmhand, once exclaimed after a day of picking ragwort out in the fields. Every summer, as the weather dries up, these weeds explode like a plague over the grass. Having the most beautiful views of Dorset has its downside. The gradient on our land means that we are unable to spray our fields to control the perennial weed, which also goes by the name of Stinking Willy. The reason we pick ragwort is that it's poisonous to many species of animal, especially the horses and cattle that roam our 60 acres. Each individual plant can create 50 to 60,000 seeds. If you leave it too long, when next year comes around, you have a seriously escalating problem on your hands. It's a never-ending job. Having spent a whole day clearing just one field, you'll come back the next day to find more that you've missed or which have sprouted overnight. Despite spending hours walking up and down our own hills, turfing them out of the ground, if I ever see others elsewhere while walking my dogs, I pull them out too. I simply see it as my civic duty. I know the pain that farmers go through to rid their land of this plant, and I know that many conservation groups will hate me for declaring it a civic duty. Although poisonous to cattle, the plants with their bright yellow heads are brilliant pollinators for bees. Moths and butterflies also use the vegetation for feeding. Unfortunately, I just can't bring myself to leave them when they spread like wildfire. Poisons in the flowers can cause liver failure, disease and ultimately death. So if an equine friend stinks of vegetation, she probably hasn't been rolling around with the stable boy in the fields. She's been pulling ragwort. The weed is now even loved by gardeners as the three foot tall yellow plant stands out beautifully in flower beds. However, the Weeds Act of 1959 imposes a duty on gardeners and landowners to prevent the weed from spreading. Last year, the owner of a horse named Diamond was jailed after her horse was found dead in a field. The mare, which was believed to have died of hypothermia, was neglected and left with no additional feed, and with no vegetation in the field, she resorted to eating the ragwort, which contributed to her deterioration and eventual death. For her crime, the woman was sentenced to 20 weeks in jail, fined £878, and banned from keeping animals for life. I won't lie, it's a horrible job, but picking ragwort is just one of the many tasks we, as custodians and carers for animals, do to ensure their well-being. I don't mind pulling out a few hundred effing trees if it keeps our cattle and horses safe. Hot Stuff by James Cousins In my last article, I wished for some dry and warm weather to start our cereal and oilseed harvest off. Little did I know what was coming. Yet again, we have broken temperature records in this country with some exceptional heat during July, and taken together with no appreciable rainfall, conditions have been challenging for all farmers and growers. We managed to start harvesting about 10 days earlier than normal with our winter malting barley crop, The moisture of the grain should be below 15% in order for it to be stored safely, and our crop was coming in at between 11 and 12%, so no drying needed. Instead, we'll have to blow cool air through it when temperatures drop. We have had a similar issue with our oilseed crop, which needs to be between 6 and 9% moisture in order for the crop to be sold without any deductions. During the extreme heat, our crop was coming in below 6%, so we had to stop harvesting and continue early in the morning or at night. If the crop is too dry, the oil cannot be extracted. This is why, during a hot spell, you might see combine harvesters working late at night when the temperatures are lower. The alternative is the risk 
that if the crop is left unharvested and a thunderstorm arrives, the oilseed pods will expand with the rain on them and the tiny seeds will drop out, resulting in the loss of the entire crop. The yields, certainly of the barley, have been encouraging, considering the dry spring and summer. Early indications from grain sample results are that it's met the malting standards and we'll be able to fulfil our contract with Molston Coors for beer production. We hope now to start our wheat crop harvesting, again 10 days early in ripening. Our cattle have not enjoyed the heat so much. Many of the grazing fields do have tree shelters for the cattle to get under, but with the milking cows we rotate around paddocks and not all of them have shade. During the very hot days, we decided simply to put the cows in the shared paddocks and give them extra feed in the form of baled silage to keep them happy. I know some farmers bring their cows inside during the heat. Great if the buildings are suitable with high roofs and fans to keep them cool. Unfortunately, ours are not really suitable for summer housing. If, as climate change experts predict, we continue to get very hot periods more frequently, we may have to adapt our buildings. Obviously, during this hot period, the risk of fire has increased, and we've tried to take precautions. The combines are blown off every day with a compressor to stop the build-up of dust around the engine and other hot parts. We always have a tanker of water in place, and also a cultivator on a tractor ready and waiting in case of fire. Luckily, we are only three miles from Blandford Fire Station, if there should be an emergency. The local fire crews visit the farm as part of their training in order to identify the risks and hazards on farms. I'd just like to thank the fire service for the support they give the farming community. I'm sure the weather will balance itself out sometime. We now need the rain for our grass to grow again. Like most people's lawns, they're all brown. Health. Keep on moving by Mel Mitchell. Just one in four people between the ages of 65 and 74 exercise regularly. Many assume that they're too out of shape, unwell, tired or just plain old to exercise. They're wrong. The older you get, the more important it becomes to keep moving. A lot of the symptoms of ageing, such as weakness, aching joints and loss of balance, are actually more likely due to inactivity rather than old age. Exercise is beneficial at every age, of course, and the human body was designed to be active. By continuing to exercise as we get older, we can stay strong and agile, allowing us to maintain our independence and our way of life. Exercising as we age becomes more important in lowering the risks of conditions such as dementia and Alzheimer's. The hippocampus is where we make and store memories, and exercising helps keep the hippocampus at a healthy size. As we exercise, blood flow to the brain increases, carrying extra oxygen and other nutrients. Exercise will actually reduce your chances of falling by building strength and maintaining balance. Gentle forms like yoga or tai chi are great for boosting confidence. If you have a chronic health problem such as arthritis, diabetes or heart disease, then exercise is almost certainly a good idea. Check with a doctor first but exercise will probably help. It helps keep blood pressure and blood sugar at normal levels and can be a silver bullet for lots of health problems. If it's been a while or you have never really been an exerciser, then simply start slow and build up. Rome wasn't built in a day. I have been fortunate to work with clients in their 60s and 70s and over a relatively short time, their improvements in movement and posture have been a great pleasure to watch. Gym work might initially seem irrelevant when you're 70, but it has meaningful real-life consequences. For one reason or another, my clients had all stopped moving as much. The universal consequence was that their joints, especially their knees, were giving them trouble. They were having difficulty standing up straight, and simply getting up from the floor had become an issue. Once they started moving more, the muscles around the knees became stronger. That meant they could squat better in the gym, of course, but out in real life it meant they could climb the stairs with ease and the aching joints almost ceased. Improvements in posture meant that they were walking upright. Their stamina also improved and they could walk for longer without being out of breath. Improvements in all-round mobility meant actions like moving their arms high above their head became possible. In real life that's dressing and reaching for things from shelves. 
Studies have found that even for people in their 90s living in nursing homes, starting an exercise routine boosts muscle strength. Other research shows that starting exercise late in life can still cut the risk of health problems such as diabetes and improve existing symptoms. But exercising doesn't necessarily mean going to the gym. It isn't for everyone. Why not join a class or start taking a daily walk? Any form of exercise works. Just keep moving. Great Skin Comes From Within by registered nutritional therapist Karen Geary. I'm writing this on the hottest day of the year so far, and across the UK, I know as much skin as possible is being exposed. We often think that the best way to get great-looking skin is with a tan or with expensive skin creams. It's true that vitamin D from the sun is a health essential, but as we all know, too much sun can cause long-term damage. The truth is that looking at what we eat is by far the best way to keep skin looking great. Vitamin C. Foods containing vitamin C, such as citrus fruits, berries, peppers and greens of any type, are mildly protective from the harsh exposure of the sun. Vitamin C is a powerful antioxidant. Carotenoids. These are recognisable by the red, orange and yellow pigments. Find them in vegetables such as carrots, pumpkins, sweet potatoes, red and yellow peppers, as well as wild-caught salmon. You will probably have heard of lycopene, a special type of carotenoid found in tomatoes and red cabbage. Carotenoids promote healthy skin cells and they act as a type of antioxidant. Polyphenols. There are more than 8,000 different classifications of polyphenol, including ones you'll probably have heard of, such as flavonoids and elagic acids. They are considered a lifespan essential given their wide-ranging properties. Polyphenols are mainly found in the dark-coloured plants. Think purple berries, pomegranates, purple grapes and red wine, dark green leafy veg, very dark high-quality chocolate, coffee, yes, and also in herbs. Herbs are extremely powerful and by weight they pack a massive dose of nutrients in themselves. Peppermint, oregano, star anise, sage, rosemary and thyme are all high in polyphenols. From a skin point of view, polyphenols protect against too much sun exposure as they are free radical scavengers. They also increase circulation. Collagen. Three quarters of the dry weight of skin consists of collagen and it's pretty much everywhere in the body. It keeps skin firm and plump looking, but unfortunately the body prioritises collagen going to other cells before it gets to hair, skin and nails. It drops naturally as we age, and collagen has become popular as a supplement. You can get collagen naturally from bone broth. Never waste the bones from your Sunday roast. Boil them for a few hours with some cider vinegar, some herbs and seasoning. Once cooled, you get that gelatinous goodness. Skim the fat off the top if you like and use as a soup base or freeze for later. You can also get collagen from liver and tough cuts of meat when they're cooked very slowly. If you do this, always buy high quality, such as grass-fed with no other additives. If you prefer marine collagen supplements, be extremely wary of how these are produced and research well. Water. I shouldn't need to say this, but water is 50 to 70% of your body weight. The answer to how much is the right amount to drink is complicated, however. It depends on what you eat, how much you weigh, your exercise levels, and so on. Rule of thumb, check your wee. Your urine should be pale yellow to colourless. If it's darker, then get drinking. And that's all in this 3rd August episode of the BV Magazine podcast. Join us again in September for more stories of rural Dorset life. Until then, it's goodbye from me, Jenny Devitt. And it's goodbye from me, Terry Bennett.